1888, a crisp fall night at Maryville College. A young Japanese student is hunched over in his dorm room, his eyes beaming with unwavering concentration while his nimble fingers shift 22 grains of corn into various positions. His desk, a drawing board for what would eventually become East Tennessee's most sacred tradition. Kin Takahashi left his small Japanese hometown of Yamaguchi Prefecture in 1886. The 17-year-old came to Maryville College after spending two years in San Francisco. I think that he heard that this was one college in America that would accept uh, Japanese students. And that in itself is, is remarkable. Maryville College had an unusual um, uh, attitude toward the world in the 19th century. The young man was breaking barriers from the moment he stepped onto campus. He was actually our uh, first Japanese student here at the college and he, even though he was not from here, he was not a southern student, he was not an American, uh, he really fit in here and he loved it here and he just fell in love with the college and the students. Although it was uncommon to see at a college campus during the 19th century, Takahashi was one of several students of color at Maryville. Partly thanks to the guy who founded it, Isaac Anderson, he w it was very inclusive. And even in the pre-Civil War days, Maryville College had some black students and had some Native American students. And uh, in the late 19th century, had some uh, Arabic and, and, uh, and Asian students, and including uh, uh, Ken Takahashi. Takahashi came to Maryville knowing very little English. There's a story that is either when he was on the train or when he had just gotten to town and didn't know much English that he uh, needed some eggs to make breakfast. And so he was trying to communicate with the farmer and basically did what we call the chicken dance in order to get the farmer to know that he needed eggs. To, he wanted to barter some stuff that he had for some eggs. Bartering is how Takahashi managed to feed himself. His family cut off all financial support when they discovered he'd embraced Christianity in America. For someone of his background, um, being a Christian was not acceptable. That was not only against their religion, it was also against their culture and against everything it meant to be from their family. Tenacious, determined, and hungry for human connection, Takahashi learned the language quickly and had no problem making friends. I think he was well loved on campus. He was a student that got along with everybody. Um, he was very excited. He was, I think he was very energetic. And he was just someone who I think was very clear in getting ideas across. One of those ideas came a short while after arriving on campus. The first person ever to carry a football in East Tennessee in the, in the Knoxville, Maryville area was Ken Takahashi. In 1889, the origin of football in East Tennessee rested in the hands of this young, unassuming student from Japan. A lot of people are puzzled that anything as popular as football even had an origin. That year, Takahashi would create, coach, and play on the first ever football team in the area. He found out about football when he was in California, and he used his knowledge of that and his wanting to get involved on campus and I think he decided this would be really fun. Let's try to play football here. In East Tennessee he's the first to introduce the game and and, and a style of the game. I mean he had he was uh, described as having cat-like agility and designing these plays uh, and really bringing creativity to the game. He would take corn and plan them different moves for the team. So how much of those were official moves and how much of those were made up by Ken Takahashi I have no idea. <laughs> At five foot two and roughly 120 pounds, Takahashi didn't have the physique of today's average quarterback. We have photos sitting here where you can see he is much smaller than the local boys who are on the team. Um, and that, but he was very fast from what we understand. So he was small, but he was fast. What Takahashi lacked in size, he made up for with perhaps questionable strategies. He was known for running around the field like a horse in order to get the other team confused about what they were supposed to be doing. <laughs> that move quickly earned him a nickname on the field. They made fun of him sometimes. They called him Kentucky Hasi uh, for Ken Takahashi. It was a play on Ken Takahashi. 
Kentucky and then also that played on the horse idea um, because he became Kentucky Hossy, as in horse. Um, and so that just kind of became his nickname. Um, and he apparently embraced the, the nickname and that was kind of his, his nickname for, for football. Recruiting players for East Tennessee's first ever football team took some convincing. Skepticism around the new sport was high. This is hard for East Tennesseans to get their, their minds around, but we didn't have football in East Tennessee in the 1880s. We had baseball, we had horse racing, we had boxing, we had a few other things. At the time, football was considered a Northern Yankee sport, certainly not for Southerners, until Takahashi began spreading the word. I think it was largely curiosity. I mean, I think his personality seemed to have overcome any kinds of questions about what he was doing, what he was introducing. I think they were all just, uh, uh, just when you, you, a bunch of people who, who probably don't look like football players, they're students mainly, and they say, gosh, here's this new sport, do you want to try it? Sure, why not? Once the team was formed and players had time to practice and scrimmage, a new problem came to the forefront. The problem with founding the first football team in a region is who do you play against? UT had formed its first football team shortly after Maryville did, and sure enough. They, they eventually played a game against UT in 1892. From what I understand, we played well, but we did not do well. <laughs> I think we lost pretty badly. <laughs> Although UT was slower to adopt football, once the team formed, the university recruited more players who also happened to be bigger in size than those at Maryville. Even so, Maryville was able to pull off some wins. We did win twice over UT. That was our big 1903 and 1906. <laughs> and the team would only get better as the years went by. Later into the early 1900s, I mean, even after he had left, the team was competing with University of Alabama and Auburn and Georgia and Tennessee. Takahashi coached and played football at Maryville for roughly seven years, but his impact did not end there. He had a way of giving back to the college, and one of the ways he did it was by being the, the spark plug that, that created the first YMCA and student union on a college campus. That building is now known as Bartlett Hall. It's important not only for what it served on campus as a, as a student uh, YMCA, but also because of how it was built. At that point, Maryville College was home to various college sports teams, including baseball, basketball, and now football. Outspoken and adamant, Takahashi became an advocate for other student athletes. He and several others formed a petition asking for a new building. In order for us to be a good competitive team, we need a gym and we need training. And so uh, they petition for a YMCA building on campus and they petition for a lot of land. They say, we will build it if you give us the plot of land and loan us $500 and promise to allow us to hire a trainer and then uh, eventually also someone to take care of the building as well. The petition was approved, but getting the funding proved to be more difficult. They did a massive campaign both here locally and throughout the country. Um, I've got an example of a certificate you would get there where we sold 10 cents a brick and so people could give anywhere from 10 cents on up. Takahashi traveled around the country to raise the total $12,000 needed for Bartlett Hall. He would be housed um, by local families, he'd be housed by churches, and he just went on the railroad from city to city, church to church. Back in Maryville, students who couldn't contribute funds contributed their time instead. They made the bricks here on campus um, during that first summer and they made over 300,000 bricks. Over 300,000 bricks and several years later, the new building was standing tall, largely thanks to Ken Takahashi. It is, I think, the ultimate testament to his selflessness and his, his uh, really his spirit of uh, volunteerism um, that, that, it, that we still celebrate to this day. Takahashi spent seven years at Miraville College. He returned to Japan two years after graduating, but kept in touch with the college through letters. He went back to Japan and, uh, and, and did well there. His parents were not happy that he was Christian but he uh, remained so, was he founded a, uh, a YMCA in Japan. Unfortunately, Takahashi did not live a long life. It's uh, kind of tragic. At 36, he developed tuberculosis and died shortly after. It's not the 
not the ending that you would have liked. You'd like to end it to you know go back and maybe start a Japanese football league or something like that, but uh, but that didn't happen. Although short-lived, Takahashi's life was one of purpose and volunteerism. Back when I was here in school, nobody knew who Ken Takahashi was, but now everybody everybody knows who. <laughs> who Ken Takahashi is, and he's that Japanese student that made such a difference. We need six more. Dan Greaser graduated from Maryville College in 1960, more than 60 years after Takahashi did. For freshman orientation, they, they bring the freshmen in now, and one of the stories they tell about the culture and the values of the college is the story about Ken Takahashi. Inspired by Takahashi's legacy, Greaser created KT Week, a time for those at Maryville College to come together and give back by completing various projects around campus. Since 1997, we've had uh, in excess of 100 people that have come back that are alumni and friends, not just, you know, alumni, but uh, people that saw what we're doing here and were willing to help. and. Uh, and they came in and uh, the project list got bigger and bigger and bigger. From painting walls to planting flowers and building benches, this now decades old tradition is a time to do good, all in honor of that one student from the 1880s. It's a, it's a fascinating story, I think it's an American story, how cultural diversity leads to beginning, new beginnings of things that become you know, distinctly American.